gentlemen, how are we all doing today? Amazing. Somebody was loud over there. Who was very loud? Fantastic. Love you. All right. I hope you're all very ready for today as we gear up for day two of Marketing 2.0. So today we have a dynamic fusion of engaging sessions, recognition ceremonies, networking opportunities, and more. But before we begin, everyone, please put your hands together in a round of applause for our bronze sponsor, Accelera, for making all of this possible. And in the spirit of that, don't forget to hashtag all of your moments, your insights on social media, such as LinkedIn or Instagram, using the hashtag marketing to Con, perfect, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, so allow me to say before we go ahead, today is going to truly be unforgettable. So without further ado, let's start our day with a very unique topic, psychographic segmentation, unlocking deep insight into the motivations and behaviors of your buyers. So psychographic segmentation is essentially like mind reading. It is psychoanalyzing your buyers instead of separating them into basic demographics like age or location you separate them into what really makes them tick what makes them passionate what are they like are they introverts extroverts adventure seekers you know do like do they like sleeping all day <laughs> like me <laughs> so what kind of people they are and ultimately their values so without further ado, allow me to introduce our moderators and our panelists. They are about to blow your minds. First and foremost, please put your hands together for our moderator, Harshal Patil, CEO and founder of B2B Venture Group. <laughs> Joining him, we have Mr. And please, Mr. Anand. Sean Karan Aranyanand, put your hands together. He is the co-founder and brand strategist of TMA Global. Did I do that right? <laughs> he really said no. Uh, then put your hands together in a massive round of applause for Ilyas Karam, strategy lead of the Gray Group. <laughs> Joined by Rakesh Gutal, the CEO of the Pivotal Media. And last but certainly not least, Ramia Pingali, founder and director of the Email Studio Inc. Put your hands together for all of them. Let me do a quick psychographic segmentation now. Uh, so yesterday we had 90 panelists at 9 a.m. Uh, today morning, last night, a few of them preferred Belgium beer. <laughs> I don't have the number because my algorithm is still running. A few of you went to downtown, a few of you went to the older Dubai. So that's what the psychographic segmentation is all about. This topic is very important uh, from the perspective of really analyzing the motivation behind the buyers actually. So before we start this particular topic, we'll just have a quick introduction, uh, maybe in 30 seconds, each one of you, if you could introduce and then we'll start off with the panel. Hi, my name is Ramya. I am from Toronto. I'm the founder for the Email Studio Inc. Um, I've been in the email marketing, lifecycle marketing field for the past 13 years. So if you have any sort of email questions, I'm here. Hi, uh, I'm Rakesh. Uh, I'm born and raised in Bangalore, India, but for the last three years I've been living in London. That's been amazing. And uh, I work on the performance marketing and advertising activation and management side of things. Um, if you have any questions related to that, I'll be happy to take them. Hello, uh, just wanted to test. Hey guys, so my name is Ilyas. I'm originally Lebanese, but uh, lived all around. Uh, my, my background actually was in finance originally, and then switched to marketing, then switched to advertising. So uh, my background's anything to do with you know, FMCG, healthcare, insurance, anything to do with brand positioning. So uh, if you guys ever need anything around that, let me know. Hello, my name is Sanand Shankar Narayanan. Uh, I'm a brand strategist and uh, I run a brand strategy studio called TMA Global. 
I help uh, businesses to become beloved brands in the category, and I work with business leaders and entrepreneurs to help their brand position right with purpose. Thank you, guys. So uh, let me just set the context pretty quickly. So uh, actually, psychographic segmentation is slightly beyond just analyzing the demographics, actually. It is slightly beyond uh, analyzing what are their choices. Uh, it's equally about also analyzing that what are their buying intents if it is, you know, B2B. On the other hand, for B2C, it is pretty important and critical to analyze what are their choices. Uh, and that can be done specifically in the B2C space by analyzing the larger data sets. When it comes to B2B, we need to analyze slightly uh, shorter data sets, but analyze what really excites them. For example, if you are a IT services company, you might want to analyze that which company sizes you want to work with. Uh, do you uh, need customers who have the onshoring or offshoring instances to the low cost countries like Philippines, Taiwan, China? Uh, which kind of titles you would like to you know, reach out to? What kind of tech infrastructure that company is currently having? This is just one example of how the psychographic segmentation can be done, but the real challenge comes into a play when it needs to be done in the real time. So Ramya, as you are involved in uh, you know, primarily uh, executing the email campaigns, I think psychographic segmentation plays quite crucial role. So if you could just you know, start off by sharing example of how you know, these insights have influenced uh, the design of an email campaign for one of your clients. Absolutely. So, um, within my experience, we've, we've, we've gone through a lot of segmentation, we've gone through a lot of different kinds of data, different kinds of information from a client, uh, from, a, from a customer as well. Uh, in my experience, the way it influences an email design is totally dependent on how the client wants to, wants to send their email out. So, for an example, uh, there was an instance where uh, we would build a dynamic small block within the email that would then display um, information, display uh, products, display anything that, that is interested or that is based on the customer's previous purchases. Uh, for an example, if we take maternity, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there, there's a lot of products out there. Uh, based, on the, based on the child's age, this was, a, this was for, a, for a toys company that I was working with, based on the child's age, we were displaying toys that the parents could buy, that the grandparents could buy, depending on who the email was going to, the information was very different. We had the data, we collected the data through forms, um, through various other means uh, for the company, and then we use that data in the email to design the email depending on where it is going and who it is going to. Okay, absolutely. Thank you for this. And uh, Rakesh, coming back to you, I think, as Ramya mentioned, I think one more important factor over there is the content, right? Now, you cannot just go and bombard the generic content to the maybe right audience or even it maybe go, it could go to the wrong audience. So in your performance marketing, you know, campaigns that you have driving, how do you ensure that, you know, mes messages are resonating with the target audience that you're reaching out and how you're doing it real time? Okay. Well, it all comes, it all boils down to one thing. That is what drives the con consumer to make a purchase or place an order on our website or our client's website or to engage a conversation with us. And um, so segmenting the audience on a predefined um, demographics to, to understand what are the motivations and desires that they possess that could lead to a inspiring conversion action. This, uh, understanding this would be more important uh, for us to drive a relevant con content and message through omni-channel presence and developing these cohorts uh, would help us uh, achieve uh, Absolutely. reaching the right audience at the right time through the right channel. Absolutely. And uh, just to connect this particular point, Elias, as you have been involved in, you know, some of the advanced uh, neuromarketing kind of techniques as well. So would love to understand that how exactly the segmentation could be done specifically, you know, in the B2C sale. Let's say if you want to analyze the shopper's behavior, how do you really segment it real time? And if you can also give use case, will be good help. 
So just to make sure, this is more about how do we segment them, right? And why do we need to do that? Fair enough. Um, I mean, the most important thing right now is to understand that there's so many different variables of what motivates people, right? So you have different sort of motive. You have people who, um, because shopper behavior isn't just one component, like do you order things last minute? Do you not check out? But it's also, if you take it a step back, it's really about what motivates people to buy these different things, right? So what we try to measure or um, build, it depends on the brand, right? So the, firstly, if you're, um, we actually had a, an audience segmentation workshop last week for one of our accounts. It was a luxury goods brand. What we needed to do is actually understand who would want to buy these products, right? And uh, who, why would they want them? And in that conversation, what you're also trying to measure is how, or try to build as a persona is, how likely are they to buy the product to begin with, right? So you start segmenting by who is the easiest to buy, the low-hanging fruit, if you will. Understand their mindset, what are they looking for? Is it status, right? Is it exclusivity? And then you start moving backwards, the people who aren't that interested in the product, because you're also building personas depending on where you are in sort of the interest level for the product. So we do a lot of this type of work um, to really look at that. So you can start from the most granular stuff to like shopping behavior on an e-commerce level to the most broad level, which is really about what motivates them, right? Status, exclusivity, a sense of belonging, community, all these different components are quite important for us. And recently, actually, a model that came out by Google, which I think is quite interesting, is the, um, it's called the messy middle. And this is sort of hijacking the way people are motivated to buy things. Um, and I think it's quite, quite interesting because they identified six key sort of uh, ways of thinking, right, which are completely about psychographic behavior. Like one of them was like scarcity bias, which is, we know, for example, if something is not that easily available, I want it. And it really shows you that certain types of psychographics will resonate with this type of behavior. And one of the things they've done, which was an interesting study, was um, when they used all six of those specific metrics, they created a fictional cereal brand against the market leader for a cereal brand. When you used all six of those things, 28% of people switched from their favorite brand to this fictional brand, which never existed, purely based on the psychology behind these six variables. I definitely recommend looking at it. And this kind of tells you why it's important to have these psychographics you know, whether it's about a sense of belonging, all these different components really can drive people to want to buy things um, beyond just the little tactical moves you would do on an e-commerce page, on a grocery page, or a food aggregator. So yeah, I think that might. Absolutely, so I think, uh, you know, uh, glad that you also demonstrated the case. Uh, now, we'll need one more perspective from you, Anand, actually, uh, with what Elias have mentioned. So you have, you are a brand strategist, actually. So from your experience in consumer you know, segmentation, what is the one advice that uh, you would give un in understanding you know, different uh, psychographic segments within the, you know, the go-to-market strategy or the target audience which is defined? Uh, so <clears throat> it, first, it first starts from defining who's your target audience at a macro level, at a top level of the organization. Then it boils down to execution on marketing on various parameters, be it ATL, BTL, above the, I mean, uh, top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, and all of that. <coughs> Once you decide the demographics, that is still a large set of population. Like say, for example, if you are launching a car brand, a luxury car brand, right? And you would probably target somewhere between 25 to 35 year old, and you can define an income level, like somebody who can afford your uh, car, car brand, a new product that you're launching, what is the income level that they should be so you can afford the car? So that's at a, a very basic level filtering that you do. And that is still a really large set of population. Businesses have one mindset, unfortunately, that everybody is my customer, the entire world is my market, right? It doesn't work like that. Our human beings, each of us are very unique. And one of the core important aspect of this psychographic segmentation is trying to understand small threads of commonality and connectivity among like the mass segmentation and then try to create one segment that belongs to you truly, right? Take two car brands, for example. You have BMW and you have Audi, right? Both are premium cars, kind of on par with pricing and all of that. But a person who buys BMW is quite different from a person who buys Rolls Royce, or sorry, uh, Audi. Price-wise, product-wise, it could be similar. Somebody wants to drive the car, right? BMW is meant for sheer driving pleasure. You enjoy that experience. 
somebody wants to be driven around i would like to sit at the back of the car and enjoy the drive and i want somebody to drive the car right that's audience right the mindset of the audience and the motivation of what moves them and what needs them right understanding this is what is core importance in the psychographic segmentation at the top level right below the business before even marketing kicks in right i'll give you another uh, example right how to even identify this segment uh in brand strategy sessions we use something called surrogates right you try and identify what kind of say for example the flight that they might take what kind of a watch brand he might buy or what kind of a car he drives so that kind of gives you the mindset and the taste of the audience that belongs to your brand right you need to know which set of brands that you can group yourself with so that gives you a bit of you know a uh, uh, homogeneity in a large segment that's where you start building the cycle absolutely thank you thank you uh, anand uh, so i think from a brand perspective i think it's quite clear but ramya i think when it comes to implementing it when you are on the ground i think it's also very crucial to segment your list let's say take an example of email marketing right so do you have any thoughts about what are some of the good ways to you know segment it very appropriate way that's a that's a very so what well, a glove doesn't fit everyone kind of a question but i would like to continue with what uh, anand was saying that at the top level when you segment your customers it's basically based on the motivation that motivation itself isn't enough for you to segment your customers when you come down to the the bottom level right you add on more layers more layers like what have they been looking at what have they been browsing um have they abandoned anything or uh, have they clicked on any of your pages or any of your products if you're taking bmw or audi for example that's a it's a very big thing i mean it's not an every day that a customer doesn't purchase it every day it's on it's on a, it's on a one to one basis you know and that would probably somebody who would come back and buy a car maybe another 5 years after or 6 years after um i work with mostly with somebody who purchases things every day like groceries for example that's on a that's a that's a this is a cyclical way that a per, customer comes back to purchase right there are certain things that are stagnant for you to segment uh, a customer on there are certain things that you can predict for a customer that is also a way that you can build your segmentation on like milk for example or flour for example you could always you can always predict that a liter of milk will be i don't know if a, if a user is a single user they've been buying groceries for 30 dollars then you know they don't they will come back to you and it's it's like a single family it's not it's not there's not a lot of people so you can always predict that the milk will be done in the next 3 days and then you can always predict and then you can always point that out to the customer that's a segmentation that you can go with um if you're going with a bit bigger ones like um like for costco for example <laughs> another grocery brand but then they come with large items everything is large you buy them you don't go back to costco to buy the same thing in a month that's another cyclical thing all you have to do to segment your customers is understand that cycle for you to understand that cycle it does not have to be um for a thousand customers at once you can go to a level when you get to implementation to a single user level as well there is a way that you can uh, combine all of these groups and layer the the motivational cause on top of it to segment your users absolutely and i think uh, uh, just would like to also bring in our discussion that we just had before some time so what ramya mentioned even in northern america as a market a <laughs> uh, very few companies have been you know using these kind of new age techniques actually i mean yes it's good to see it on the paper it's good to see it on the dashboard but when it comes to actually you know going to the ground and you know analyzing multiple tech stacks it's 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 not you know happening around actually i mean it's it's good to also have during a panel discussion so my question to you rakesh is as you are working with lot of shopify companies as well what other psychographic variables that uh, you know it could be a personality traits it could be value it could be interest opinions or lifestyle so what are some of the variables that you know usually you explore and how you analyze it actually if you could okay so uh, the consumer demand is a ever changing aspect right when whenever it comes to e-commerce or uh, uh, 10 years back e-commerce wasn't a thing so now e-commerce is everything so uh, 
based on the user purchase power and based on the user buying behavior, we'll be able to segment the users based on the products they would need. For example, let's say if you buy a shoe, you need a shoe polish. If you buy, your, if you buy a blazer, you need a coat hanger. Right? So you know your products, with, you know your consumers who are already predefined based on the products they already purchased. And when we are trying to implement it uh, from various advertising platforms and media agencies or media publishers, we'll be able to get the data, hands-on data on these particular segments so we can implement our advertising strategies and advertising messages targeting those particular consumers to drive higher conversion rates and higher order values. But it comes at a cost, right? So our CPAs would directly increase by easily up to 7%, but our order values are going to be uh, much higher than that. OK, absolutely. And uh, 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 Ilya, so what Rakesh have mentioned, I think for such kind of mechanism, you really need a huge data sets to be analyzed, which is a big data, right, in a way, and to process that particular data. Do you think that uh, you know this big data is hijacking you know consumer behavior to actually create these personalized messages? Absolutely, to be honest, I think it's pretty clear that data is king, but it's only king for one specific thing. If it's actually creating a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, right? It's not about having data just to have data. And I think a lot of brands have made it sort of a habit where they just need to collect data as much as they could possibly get. They're like, all right, let me just mine as much data as possible. But if it's not actually creating something more meaningful, it's useless, to be honest. So what's important, I mean, and actually an example that we use, so where I work at WPP, for example, we have a tool called BAV that has roughly 16 billion data signals. And that, I mean, just the sheer number of that tells you a lot about this. But what we've done is we've been able to track specific metrics that we use for the specific brand. So for example, if we wanna know what aspect of the brand they like, they don't like. And you can start creating more nuanced messages to talk to them about that specific aspect. Like if they think you're innovative but not a visionary brand, what are you gonna do with that? And there's something actionable about these things. So it's super important that the data you're using creates something more specific of a message to the consumer. And I think one of the best, depends how you think about it actually, but one of the best platforms that do this is sort of uh, your social media sort of platforms, right? Your Googles, your, your uh, Instagrams, all of that. Spotify, for example, everyone that really collects first party data has done a pretty good job trying to c create more personalized messages. I think most of us here have heard of Spotify at least. I know Spotify wrapped, you know, the end of the year sort of platform they have. It's a great case study, to be honest, of something personalized depending on the user. It's personalized for every single person here, right? Like no one, no two people have the exact same Spotify wrapped. It's completely specific to what you look up, to the type of music, the genre, what does it say about you? That's a great case study for me of you know, a brand that does first big data correctly at least. And I think it's done, the, 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 the importance and weight of big data is twofold in terms of personalized messages. Firstly, it's created a situation where if you're not talking to the person one-to-one, -one, you've lost their interest, they don't care anymore. And what you end up happening is lower engagement rate. So if your content doesn't speak to that specific person, you've lost them. And that's the thing that you need to know when you have all these data points. And it's, it's something we're beginning to see. So a lot of times, you know, I'm sure everyone's seen this. You get a YouTube ad, you're like, this has nothing to do with me at all. Skip ad, right? This is what most people will do unless in the first couple of seconds, it speaks to you directly in such shape or form. And one of the things you do with that is sort of affinities messaging. And I, I remember a couple of years back, we worked on a, on a campaign for KitKat. And it was a, this idea called give YouTube a break. So it was completely specific to what you were looking up on YouTube based on your interest, right? So if you were looking up football, like a watching a match, you would get a specific ad, it was five seconds, it was a bumper ad, very short, six seconds actually. And it was saying, you know what? We know you're looking up football, give YouTube a break before your, you know, your football, <laughs> football stream comes up. Yeah, so you had like 80, 100 different types of messages for this and it was so pinpointed to what you were looking up. And that's a good example of big data being used here to create something more specific to the person. So just key point, like, if you're gonna go for data, I think everyone should. Just make sure it's something more personalized to the consumer depending on what they're doing online. I'd just, I'd just like to add to what uh, Elias was just mentioning as well. It's not, um, that level of personalization is possible even at the bottom level. I remember the campaign when you mentioned uh, the KitKat ad actually. We had happened, we happened to send an email out with personalized video messages that included 
just not the person's name, even the products that they previously purchased, including the loyalty points that they have that they can spend on um, during Christmas. Basically, this is for, for, for the UK market, but uh, yeah, they, this level of personalization can be pulled down to the bottom level of marketing as well if you want to. So if you have the capability for the big data and for the analytics at your company, then I would say make full use of it because that is how it's going to be going forward. Nobody wants to get the same email. Nobody wants to get a 10 off of 500 purchase. They don't, they don't, they don't consider you that you're a brand that knows the, the user if, you, if, you, if you're just blasting out stuff. It needs to be more personalized and I think that's the path that people are going to take going forward. Absolutely. So on one side, you know, there is a, a data of recommendations, predictions, right? And on the other side, there is a brand values, what we want to do, we shouldn't dilute it. So now in both the aspects, there is a thin line on which we need to, you know, uh, walk always. So my question to you, Anand, is... I think that's a constant fight. That's a constant fight. Now, in fact, I recall one of the example of, uh, I'll not name it, but one of the largest, you know, uh, healthcare company in India, you know, on their uh, online platform, they were selling something and then analytics shows that, you know, this is something where, you know, you will see a surge in trend and they diluted the brand and brand was vanished in three years. Now, from that perspective, I think it's pretty important to have that thin line. So from your experience, Anand, how can brands effectively balance actually the needs and desires of, you know, this distinct psychographic segments while maintaining the cohesive, uh, you know, uh, uh, brand identity. Uh, there are a couple of uh, psychological aspects that are in, that gets implemented at a top level. Okay. Uh, again, everything is from the user perspective, right? You need to understand and study the values and beliefs of that target audience segment that you're trying to kind of go behind. That comes with deep consumer research and try to get a big insight from that market. It's where it, it believes. And personality and lifestyle of the audience. These four parameters kind of help you define why they do what they do, right? That's number one. And <coughs> to be honest, uh, Harshal, uh, specifically to the domain of marketing, there is no one specific right way or like, wrong way actually right unlike other domains like in uh, in physics chemistry there's law of physics there's law of engineering it has to behave in that particular way follow these steps you get the results right but in in marketing especially in today's world there are completely new ways of brands being built which nobody else tried before and they're proving to the world that it is possible right i'll give you an example that all of us can easily relate to you don't have to necessarily understand the audience within your category to create a segmentation. You can create a new audience segmentation by looking into other categories completely, right? I'll take Liquid Death as an example, right? It's a brilliant brand. Like people who have heard of this brand or know, knew this brand, they built a new category from the scratch. They built a blue ocean in the category, right? It's a water brand, right? Mountain water brand, a category which is supposed to be extremely boring a category for any brand to operate in. They all speak about health, holistic wellness. You feel good when you kind of refresh yourself with water. That's what everybody is tom toming about it in the whole category, right? It's all about slow throwing down and like calm, peace and all of that. Liquid death understood by studying the market and segmented one consumers which are waiting to be served, right? There's a segment of audience who goes to parties who don't drink. Right? Unfortunately, they pretend that they had to drink to be a part of the social network. That's a mindset, that's a motivation for them, right? And there's no brand that is serving to them or speaking to them. So they didn't went behind water drinking segment. They went behind cola or even like alcohol drinking segment and converted one whole segment of audience, right? They just packaged the water into like a cool looking beer can, an aluminum can, and they just went bazooka on creativity, which is extremely opposite of what the category is doing, right? This again, by understanding one segment of audience, this is what I said, <coughs> values and beliefs and the personality and lifestyle. That's where you actually create a new category and serve them. So there is absolutely no one right answer or wrong answer to kind of balance the paradox that 
most of the marketers fight in today's day and age. See, that's the beauty of psychology and human behavior. Everybody is so unique, right? Everybody behaves in a particular way. And humans behave extremely irrationally, right? If you take, um, uh, I'll give you one example again, why this irrationality comes up in human beings. So you take a couple of airlines, uh, take Virgin, uh, and take Qantas, right? Imagine both these flights are traveling between London and Australia, right? And uh, the same hardware, both uses Boeing, okay? It's the same uh, service process that you go through. You go into the airport, check in, security, get your boarding pass, gate, board the flight, and depot, right? Both are extremely the same. The moment you put the label on it, right, your virgin versus your like contest, the perceptions completely change, the personality completely change. You appeal to a totally different audience. One is about like corporate, I'm like, like I have one classic classiness with me, I behave only in this particular way. The other side is completely on the opposite spectrum, right? I'm like young, daring, I will, I will exactly do what others are saying not to do or other brands are not doing it. So, and, and human beings also behave very irrationally because the primary reason for any aircraft that we have to ideally choose and why we have to fly a particular aircraft is the safety features, right? There are like a million parts in the flight that's working together to safely carry us from one destination to the other destination. But the biggest decision making criteria for us to choose one airline or dump other airline is, I didn't get the food served hot in that particular flight. I don't like the air hostess there, they're very snobby, right? That's extremely trivial, right? The core of your decision making needs to be different. That's why human beings are very irrational in the way we choose and decide. And as in psychographic segmentation, at least we have to try to understand the irrationality and try to make a sense of it to make a segmentation. And um, adding to that, by making that segmentation, you'll stand out among your competitors and be unique as a business as well and drive more returns on it, correct? I can add that. Yeah, I just wanted to add something to this because this is uh, the timeless struggle we have with clients trying to tell them why psychographic segmentation is important, right? When you try to make, I mean, the, the case study I always use, to your point exactly, Anand, was uh, I use pumpkin spice latte. Yep. It's, I mean, it's the perfect example of human irrationality, right? This one product sells a year, $100 million a year. That's one SKU, that's what it brings. Why? because it reminds people of the fall. It's associated with the fall. It only comes out, or autumn, whatever, depending what you call it, but it only comes out in this time, and that's when people want it. They don't have anything else, not hot chocolate, not, it's this specific product. And I think the more you start building a brand that taps into this way of thinking, that what people want is comfort, they want these types of different elements, the more you can create a very successful product. The most successful products tap into this psychology, and they understand that that's how people think, and that's how people buy things, actually. So Elias, in alignment with what you just mentioned, I think all the discussions that we are having today is because of the motivations behind the shoppers or the buyers actually. So are you seeing any, you know, evolving landscape into it? Uh, do you think the, you know, uh, the uh, shoppers behaviors are changing eventually? And then uh, how has, you know, uh, this entire thing have shaped up? I think, so do you have any thoughts on this? Sure, fair enough. Um, look, there's aspects of this conversation where they stay timeless, right? There's what motivates people as humans in general. There's an aspect of that that stays always true, right? We always want, like the quality of wanting to feel part of an exclusive club, that always stays true. The fact that I need to be part of a like-minded community, that stays true. Those aspects stay true no matter what time period you're going in. Where it starts to change, especially with the role of like social media, for example, or digital landscape, is that it begins to become almost dimensionalized on a more micro level, right? Social media starts almost making things a lot more micro. So for example, on TikTok now, there's a big trend around aesthetics, which is what's your look? What do you look like? Are you this type of person, this type of person? And people wanna be part of that community. They want that kind of validation from that specific tribe. And I think that's one of the things that is beginning to change a little bit more. Not so much the behavior, but <coughs> the fact that it gets more micro as a, as a component. And one of the biggest things that has changed, for, um, I think this, this holds true through social and digital, is triggering that type of behavior, right? It's the triggers that actually start changing what people want to do, right? What triggers me to want to suddenly be part of that clique? What triggers me to want to get status or be part of a trend? And I think 
a lot of new, like TikTok is a great platform for this because they have this sort of community commerce model, which is, I mean, we all know the awareness, consideration, conversion funnel, right? How you sell stuff. If you look at their model, it's all about the community. No matter what phase you're in, it's kind of like a circle model rather than a linear line. And the whole point is you need community, you need people. And what ends up happening with that type of model is that I'm triggered at the most random times to want to be part of that club. And what you see is, for example, people are more impulsive on social now, they buy things. I think it was 71% of people do unplanned purchases now. Uh, and that just tells you how that's changed my motivation for behavior because on a more micro level, I'm triggered differently and motivated differently. And I think trigger-based content is a very important tool now for people to leverage on social that I think they, most brands use it only from a functional perspective, right? Like, oh, if I'm searching for a fitness products, here's my product. But I think you can do so much more with this. You can do something way more interesting um, to drive different motivational behavior. A great example that uh, I like to use is I'm on InstaShop, which is like this sort of, uh, or you can order groceries here. Um, menthols did a great idea. So anytime you searched for something that could give you bad breath, like garlic, onions, whatever, you would get an ad from Mentos saying, you know, bad breath, order the menthols. So it was so real time, it was so smart, um, and it made me want to buy the product in that moment because they knew exactly what I was doing or what exactly I needed. And I think it's important to realize that's changing people's behavior, right? The motivations, I wanna still feel cool, I still wanna feel like I belong, that's still there. But on the micro level, that kind of message gets me to want to buy something, right? And it's always, I think a lot of brands struggle to see how they can leverage these touch points as something more interesting. They kind of think, oh, it's just another touch point. I can actually talk, you know, my functional product. And I think for one of our accounts now, we're like Panadol and, and Sensor and all this, we're trying to get them to see those touch points as something more emotional that you can do with your brands. You know, not just talk about pain, but actually what can I do in that space that could be interesting for the brand, right? Exactly like what Mentos did, what could your brand do on this front? Absolutely, and I think this example of Mentos. I'd just like to add to yeah. it, actually. So the shift that you're talking about, um, we have to remember it, it was post-pandemic, and there was, a sh there was something else this, that was pre-pandemic. The unplanned buying behavior that you were talking about was prevalent when people went in store, mostly pre-pandemic, and that kind of shifted online because there was like an e-commerce boom through the pandemic, and then that's what happened. This is social media. There's 71% um, unplanned purchases on social media. That kind of shift is re is required. Like it, like the brands need to keep an eye on how the consumer is is shifting, um, and how their shopping behavior is shifting. You have to be agile enough to make those changes into your segmentation as and when these shifts are happening. Unfortunately, that we see that these shifts are happening much faster than they used to previously. Um, there are certain brands that, that believe that the shopper's behavior has kind of gone back to what it was pre-pandemic, so they have to make those shifts back to then, but it does make, it does affect the revenue generation because they did see a huge, humongous amounts of profits during pandemic versus what they've seen previously. That kind of balance, uh, informative balance, I think, is also needed to be, to be made. Absolutely. So just to uh, have you know, before I have next controversial question to you, I just want to connect the dots. So we spoke about data, we spoke about the brand value, we spoke about the thin line, correct? Now there is one more, you know, layer into it, which is a privacy, privacy. Now, uh, you know, see, from a, being a marketer, we always want to respect the privacy of the customer. And to be very honest, more than my cat, I have seen, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in the court Every day he is in the court answering something and the reels are going viral, right? So the customer privacy is very important. So what are your thoughts on that? So let's say if we are mapping the right messaging, how we need to, how we are going to ensure uh, the privacy is, you know, maintained, the thin line is, you know, balanced actually. And would also like to have your opinions as well on the same. Absolutely. Um, I think privacy starts when you collect the data, consent. Ask your customer, tell your customer what you're collecting and what for. That is very important. Um, unless that is clear to the customer, them giving you data is more like stealing. And I don't think that's what needs to be done. Um, I've seen, I've been at clients that were unclear with their privacy policies and we had to go through the whole drama, GDPR. It's a scary word, but... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they are in place to protect the user. 
and for brands to safely uh, use the data that the user is giving you and make these changes in your segmentation that we're talking about and give give your product to them based on whatever whatever they, their interests are. But yeah, privacy is very important. Um, consent, I guess, is the most important piece. Your data collection practices need to be pristine to the point and have to be told to the user very clearly why are you collecting and what are you collecting, most importantly. Anand, what are th your thoughts about the privacy? So I think uh, there's a very fine line between uh, trying to give personalized experience to consumers uh, versus being very creepy in their life, right? It's a very thin line. So you need to know where to draw a line. It's a very nuanced approach. There's no hard line that you can unfortunately draw boundary. In some cases, consumers are more than happy if you probably uh, predict what they're looking for and give them that experience. And sometimes they just like go all out. It's like, no, this is not what I wanted. It's quite creepy. They're going way into my life beyond I want them to be, right? So I think it, it, de it depends from category to category or use case to use case. You know, I think as marketers should know where to really draw a line. Shouldn't go overboard just because you have to give the personalized offer. Yeah, privacy is extremely important. It can actually make or break the brand's reputation. That just reminded me actually, it was a very recent campaign by Target. Um, they happened to send an email to one of the user's parent telling them that their child is pregnant. And the parent did not even know. It was all because of the of the data that they collected on the user. And depending on the browsing, creepy. yes, that that's is creepy. that's the line. That's the that's beyond <laughs> going personalized. Yes. Yeah. Man, honestly, I, I got an example. You guys were saying this. I actually got this uh, about two weeks ago from a flower shop, and they were like, "Oh, it's uh, been 28 days since you last made an order from a, from us." And I was like, "And that's it. They just left it there." And it wasn't like they were like, "Oh, we'll try this promotion," you know. And I think. It was really creepy, like that. They're like, tw it was also. I don't know who thought twenty days was the thing you need to talk to somebody <laughs> about. But but I think what's important also is to know, like, the the way what you're gonna do with this data is important, right? Don't just tell people we're watching. You know, like I think that's not what you want to tell people. If you're gonna use that data, try to find something interesting with that, right? Try to be helpful. Try to do something. So if you if you haven't checked out from something, hey, listen, can we do something to help you out? You know. Don't feel like Big Brother trying to like watching over every little metric. Try to actually help them make their life better. Something witty, for example. You, you mentioned a good point. When you try personalized and helpful in you know some yeah, yeah. ways, right? You it will solve a potential problem that they might face. Yeah. That the brand is using. So that being personalized. Exactly. And that your example, that's extremely creepy if it's not. Yeah, they didn't say, hey, you're looking up onions. <laughs> you want like no, it, they just directly went here. That's super important. Yeah. Absolutely. Raghi, do you have any thoughts? Um, on? Yes, actually. So as everyone of you said, uh, the abuse of the data which we collect, we should be able to have a control on it. And we should be able to give the users an option to control the data they share with us. So with these two changes, I think we sh should be able to build a more personalized, accepted messages by the consumers. And we wouldn't be abusing. Uh, or being creepy or being the big brother for any of our customers. Absolutely. So I think onboarding, uh, to onboard the new customers, I think psychographic segmentation is quite pivotal. Having said that, even to retain the customers, it is actually going to support a lot. So Ramya, I would love to hear your thoughts on how the segmentation can be used in order to improve the customer retention rate throughout the life cycle of the campaign. Absolutely. Um, the way you segment your customers when they get to know you is um, very different from how you would segment a customer after they know you as a brand and they have left you for somebody else. The, the segmentation that you would need to bring that customer back to buy you, uh, buy from you, is, is something that you'll have to concentrate on separately. Um, like I would, I would say that, that the psychographics, uh, sorry, the, the segmentation that you would do all along your life cycle is very different at different parts, basically, right? Um, for retention itself, you would look at things like um, how long has it been that the, that the user hasn't browsed, hasn't bought from you, um, hasn't checked you out, basically. Maybe they haven't clicked on your ads, they haven't seen your social media posts. All of it, a lot of other touch points that they've been seeing along. Um, all of that matters. Any interaction that they've been having with you as a brand is an interaction, is a touch point. 
um, that you can lean on to bring them back onto you to, to buy from you. Um, but unless you don't have, if you don't have that kind of a 360 degree on your customer, the, the least you could do is go by their purchase date. When have they last purchased from you? They have they purchased 30 days ago, have they purchased 60 days ago, 90 days ago, a year ago. I would draw a line at six months uh, because anybody over six months is definitely not interested in you as a brand. Mm -hmm. There's no point you going behind them. Um, I would then probably try and get this user back by giving them um, a coupon. I do not, I have a very, I'm very strongly opinionated about giving um, users a first time coupon. You would develop a habit and I've seen that yeah, firsthand. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is what I suggest against, but retention-wise, you do need it because this person was loyal with you. You have to reward the loyalty. They haven't seen that reward and that's why they've left you. So if you reward the loyalty, there's a chance that the person will come back and buy from you. Um, anything over six months, I would say that the user has probably found a competitor that is best suited for them. They might not likely come back to you. So your spend on them will not generate the ROI that you would look for. So there's no point, or I would say lesser um, chances of you spending that dollar amount on them and you finding it way back to you. Absolutely. So before we now open up for the question and answer, I'll just summarize what we just discussed in four lines actually. So uh, in psychographic segmentations in a nutshell, we don't just find out who our customers are. We learn actually why they prefer cat over dogs, latte over espresso, or binge watching over sleep. So diving into psychographic segmentation is like reading minds without the superpowers. And it's just a spoiler alert, it's 90% coffee and 10% pie chart. <laughs> so, so using psychographic segmentation is actually like a reading a diary that your customers didn't know they were writing. Okay, And uh, in a nutshell, it's also about tracking several areas like engagement rates, conversion rates by segment, CSAT scores, brand loyalty scores, CLV, uh, campaign response rate, sentiment analysis, behavioral analysis, and content interaction patterns as well. So uh, it will actually help you guys to also identify new niches into the market, create more brand advocates, and uh, it will also improve the customer retention. So now would love to open up for the question and answer. Some questions. Can I take this one? Would you uh, mind repeating the question for the audience? Hi. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, um, Anesu from South Africa. My question was, with psychographic segmentation, how would you translate it into a B2B setting? It makes, well, for me, it makes more okay. sense, and you can see it clearly when it comes to the consumer, but now when it comes to a B2B segmentation, it's, it's a little bit more complex. Yes. Yeah. I think I'll give you one example, uh, again, the psychographic segmentation for B2B varies industry to industry because the buying behaviors could be different. I'll give you one example for staff augmentation and IT services company who is providing the services for the analytics. Now, what specifically we are analyzing, point A, is whether do they have any offshoring instances to the low-cost countries, which shows that you know they are likely to outsource. Second is, do they have current engineering team? If they have, then what is what are their strength areas looks like? Third, in their existing ecosystem, what tech infrastructure they are using, whether they are on SAP, whether they are on Salesforce. And the fourth one is we also analyze what kind of need intent that has been leveraged. So let's say if there are 500 accounts, the companies who are recruiting for Python could be a strong instance or an indicator that they might have a need for the analytics. So again, it is a case to case. Based on your case, maybe after the session, would love to help you of, of what could be the buying drivers. So if I can add uh, two points to this, I think it 
it's always important to know, even though it's B2B, and this is something we, we try to talk to our clients about, you're still talking to people behind that, right? So, I mean, an example, we had, uh, I think six months ago, a FinTech company talk to us, like one of our audiences is SMB businesses, right? And we were like, well, actually, who you're talking to there is people who are entrepreneurs or people who are passionate about what they're doing there. And, you, and if you kind of reverse engineer that, you can bring something quite human about that conversation to them. And I just think it's quite important to always remember that a corporation, every aspect still has people behind that conversation, right? People that you're talking to. And it's not necessarily profiling them, but profiling what they're trying to do, what they're trying to achieve out of their business, and what that business specifically is trying to achieve. So if the objective for one, let's say you're talking to a merchant or a, a bank, it's always important to know what that bank's trying to achieve. Is it about, you know, is it about giving people opportunities? Is it about people, and I think that helps also when you're trying to add a psychographical component to the segmentation for those B2B businesses. Uh, I have one more point to your question. So in, in B2B, this is uh, unfortunately completely overseen, right? It's not yet considered as a critical component. And where I feel psychographics come into picture in B2B is identifying and trying to get your competitive positioning done, right? Like if you, most B2B companies pitch the, uh, the whole business only from the product point of view, what the product can do for you. Beyond that, in the organization, there is a user, actual user of your product, there is an influencer who might influence your product to be purchased, and there's an actual buyer. The three different people who are involved in getting one deal signed, right? And B2B companies need to understand what are their motivations and pain points and challenges that each of them are going through. They're not the same. They're completely different, right? How do you make sure your product can help the influencer to sign up with your product to see the value in it, right? Like, it goes beyond B2B. It's still human to human. It's not one human to human. There are like three different sets of people that you're kind of dealing with. If you start understanding and reading their motivation and behavior, you can completely position and help the organization at a bigger level. So that's where psychographics comes and helps in a very big way in B2B. Yep, and adding to what just Anand said, um, understanding where the uh, uh, the business is in their buying cycle. So that would also help you to position yourself in terms of pricing or in terms of competitors so that you'd be able to win over the businesses. Same question, okay, great. Anyone else? Thank you. That was very impressive. I came in a little bit late, so I apologize. Um, I was um, very, very taken by when uh, the middle speaker, I, I didn't get your name, I'm sorry. Um, you, you talked about triggers. Uh, so I come from the service industry and, and really on um, dealing with people and behaviors and that sort of thing. Again, B2B, because I, I work for corporates, um, but it doesn't, nothing stops me from going to B to C. Now here's the interesting part. Um, what would you, how, could you share some examples of um, behavioral triggers? Examples, right? Because you know, it's usually we're talking about products. What about service? If we were to sell, um, you know, fixing a behavior service, uh, for example, leadership style or whatever, then what could be some examples of those triggers? and? Uh, what could be a good platform to work with? It's a very good question. Um, so, so in the case of leadership, I'll use that one as an example, right? Let's say we know somebody is trying, we, you want to push your, let's say your service is leadership courses, right? Let's just assume that's the case for the situation. What you would want to start looking at are obviously the very direct triggers, which is looking up leadership courses. That's the most obvious choice, right? What, but then there's secondary things, proxies, to, which is what we sort of call as proxies. So somebody, you'd have to think, what is the mindset of somebody who is looking for something like this? So in the case of leadership, perhaps self-help, you know? So for example, somebody searching for self-help, you might want to use that trigger, for example. If somebody is searching for things around wellness or um, confidence or, um, or even you could use shows where there's aspirational leaders that they might like. So for example, I mean, it's an easy example, but it's not necessarily the, the right one. Somebody who likes Harvey Specter from Suits, for example. <laughs> if you're somebody you know watches that show, you might find that you might find that character aspirational. So based on that show, you could put a piece of content out there that talks about leadership courses. You know, be like Harvey, something like that, right? 
and and honestly, any platform that, if we were talking about like big data, that has access to that kind of data, whether it's YouTube, search, really any any platform that you think would be relevant to that. So if you end up saying the trigger I want to find is something like the case of Soup, Harvey Specter, for example, you would then want to say where would, that could be anything, anything from TikTok to Instagram, literally any platform with rich data and that behavior that would be relevant, you would use those platforms. And, uh, and on top of what just Elias said, you can also look into communities as one of the triggers. So let's say if a person is joining a digital marketing agency services or is looking for something or he wants to learn something and he joins a group on LinkedIn or Discord or anything. So that's a trigger for you to identify that person would be interested in buying a course or learning from you. So. Just one technical addition into it. So as LinkedIn doesn't allow us to parse the APIs, we need to do this exercise manually, specifically for LinkedIn. But for Facebook and Instagram, we can do it, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll explain you. Absolutely, everyone, please feel free to hunt down our panelists after the panel and ask them any questions you want. Um, that was a really cool example about suits and, and uh, that was, I think, yeah, I think especially for younger people, mine was be like Walter White. Okay, so coming up next, who else has a question? Hi, my name is Victoria. Thank you, first of all, it's been a very enlightening session. Um, I wanted to ask, um, to be honest, I regret it every time I pressed subscribe to the newsletter button, every single time. My email gets bombarded. Yes, it's becoming more interactive. They're redirecting to websites. They're putting catchy lines. But at the end of the day, I'm a data scientist. I don't want those data points just hanging there. Do you feel there can be a more consumer-friendly way to touch and remind about the brand? I can take that. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I am on board with you. Um, as an email marketer, I can vouch for you that I don't read every email. Nobody does. Um, that's the truth that brands need to believe. And just like yourself, there are 1,000 million other brands that are trying to get to users with, through the newsletter system. So I get with you. I, I understand your pain with the bombardment and all the data points that are being collected. Um, some of the efficient ways that I see, that, uh, that at least I suggest my clients, mainly is a preference center. Very needed. Like if you have um, a base over, a, I don't know, like 5,000 people, I would say start using a preference center so you can collect the right information that you need from the user so you don't bombard them with all the emails, unnecessary emails that need to go out. Um, then you have to use something called as an RFM, which is, I'm getting a little bit technical, but RFM model is a low-hanging model that any business can use to segment their users and send emails on about the right content about, about at the right time. These are the two things that I think in combination can control the bombardment that you're talking about, and it can be um, on a necessity basis uh, than on a want basis for, for, a, for a brand. All right, does anyone else have a question? Hello everyone, so my name is Rana. Uh, I'm the marketing director for Maristo Hospitality. Uh, so we're mainly B2C business uh, and it's an F&B industry. Today, my question is about conversion rate and ROI because uh, we all know like the digital marketing is the way forward, but again, any business owner or any like industry like is looking after the ROI or like what is the outcome of this uh, campaign, if it's uh, an email blast or a social media campaign. So what is the, let's say, how, would you, how do you consider a campaign is successful when it comes to conversion rate? Um, can I start? Yeah. Okay. It depends on the campaign that you're doing. Um, 
for example, if you're sending an email out with a voucher, it could be the redemption rate, that could be your success metric for the campaign. Um, it could be the open rate. Open rate is very low hanging and now it's, I don't think you should even consider that as a success metric anymore uh, with, uh, with the MPP in place and, and a lot of other things. But you could look at um, something called as click to open rate. Um, that is, that measures the interest a user is showing in the content of the email. That could be a success rate as well. Um, it could be things like if you're sending an automation, like an onboarding automation, you could look at click reach, but you can look at open reach. These are two metrics that not a lot of brands know about. It looks at a continual, it, it looks at a cyclical behavior of a user that is coming back to you. Um, it could be any interaction with you. So your click reach and open reach could be a success metric for your automation. There are various other things uh, that you could look at, but it totally depends on what kind of campaign that you're sending out or what kind of email that you're sending out to the user. Yep, when it comes to actual ad campaign management and uh, across all the media channels, I would say uh, the most important metric that I would look for uh, is the customer uh, lifetime value and the retention rate of the customers and uh, the frequency of uh, the frequency of buying uh, by a single customer. So these metrics will help me identify if there are any changes that needs to be done on the product or in terms of uh, messaging or in terms of uh, reaching to the customer. So this would, these are the really important metrics that I would look for when it comes to campaign management. I'd like to premise this that conversion is the bane of my existence. It's because it's, it's a great metric. It's just one of the hardest metrics. Everyone seems to want to focus on that, right? And it's not a bad thing. I think it's always just good to contextualize it with two aspects. The first point is that you want to look at the industry benchmark. So it depends on your category, where you're at. Some, some, because people don't look at your brand just by itself, right? It's within the vacuum of where it exists. So if you're in hospitality, I'm looking, as a, let's say I'm a consumer here, I would be looking at that in the context of not just your brand, but the world of what your brand usually tells me. Is it the brand that, do they push a lot of newsletters? Do they push a lot of emails? <laughs> if that's the case, you're gonna get a much lower industry benchmark. So I think it's always good to look at that first before you assess what is considered successful. Because plenty of times clients come to us and say, we want, I don't know, 30% conversion rate. And then you're like, well, actually in your benchmark, actually in this case, you'd only be get 30%. You know, it's, it, the industry benchmark is a bit lower. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah I agree right. with you. And I think the second point, um, which I think is just as important, is what does conversion mean to, to the brand, right? So some brands, conversion is sending traffic to the website. It's about downloading an app. It's about getting sales. We assume conversion means sales, right? But sometimes it's not actually that, right? Sometimes if you're launching a website, conversion means subscribing on that website, you know? So depending on that, then you also know how successful it is. And then the, the benchmark changes. To get somebody to actually buy the product is different than to get somebody on the website, right? It takes a lot of an investment. Thank um, you. Would, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I kind of disagree with the benchmarking point of view. I'm sorry. But, um, <laughs> but that said, it could be a good start point. I wouldn't say <coughs> give the, uh, use that as a comparative measure. Yeah. You should be your own comparison. You sh your metrics should be your own comparison. A-B testing is very important. Um, test your campaigns and then see what works better Based for you. Based on historical data from yes. previous campaigns, this is the best benchmark. I totally agree with you. And yeah, definitely also, uh, as you said, like uh, the industry benchmark can be a good uh, option, but it's not very accurate. It's yeah, not. It's not you it's cannot not. rely on it 100%. No. Yeah, I it's agree with changing you. so fast that you cannot rely on an industry exactly. benchmark. And it's yeah. an average of somebody with 100 users to 100 million users. There's, there's nothing that you can get. You have to tailor it for yourself. So A-B testing always. Keep testing okay. it and then you can go ahead. I just Thank want you. to add one more thing into it. So along with the A-B test of the existing campaigns, I think region-wise as well, we need to do a lot of the content syndication, yeah. like the cultural tonality, appropriate call to action, what sort of readability scores that region have seen. For examples, uh, you know, in the US, the email should be not more than four lines. Uh, on the other hand, in India or Middle East, people want to see the descriptive emails. So considering the existing uh, aspects of the outside, you know, competitive index, I think those aspects also support in order to 
boost that conversion actually or get the attention of the potential prospects? Uh, to give you a different perspective here, uh, yeah, there's a reason why it is called a marketing investment, right? And we have to define what kind of an investment is it. It's going to be a tactical investment or a strategic investment, right? So tactical investment, you only look at short term, right? That is like push. You're trying to push it only from your end and expecting people to open and start doing the conversion. How are you going to start making the investments where the pull starts happening? Right? You don't have to push it. People started automatically coming, gravitating towards your brand, right? That's a larger uh, time frame of investment that any brand should take. While it's important on short term that you analyze these metrics and try to do it, your optimization on better conversion rates, better ROI comes when your brand starts having a pull from the market. You don't even have to do this push marketing. You will probably have the best industry benchmark rates in the world. Why would uh, 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 why would consumers are willing to pay a premium price to Apple versus not that behavior to a Vivo or an Oppo? Right? There's a difference, right? So they've created a pull around it first at the same time while doing the tactical investment. So I think it's important for all the brands to balance both the type of investments so the second type of investment is going to get you a much bigger ROI, very similar to our personal finance and personal investments. You have to give time to get that compounded return, right? The brand equity, that's why it's called brand equity, right? There's a reason for it, right? Over long term, that equity gets built through your long term strategic investments. That'll help you on all the short term tactical activities. I think you have to balance both. Agree. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Nitin. Uh, I have a question related to email marketing. I mean, generally when we talk about the conversion rate and the open rate, I mean, sometimes I get confused in order to you know, book the discovery call with the consumer or the client. And uh, I, mean, I mean, sometimes you know, I become so skeptical, you know, telling to my people that the conversion rate you know, comes between 3% to 5%, you know, if you're sending uh, 30,000 emails in, in a month, so how we define, how do we, you know, set a benchmark in order to understand, you know, what would be the conversion rate and also keeping in mind that, you know, which country we are targeting, like you mentioned about, you know, in tier one country, especially UK or US, you know, uh, they consider a single or three to four lines of email. And when they click on the email, uh, that's how the conversion rate would be counted. And, but they, don't end up, you know, uh, you know, scheduling the call or that that's the first thing. Um, so how do we define this? How do we understand in, in order for the conversion, measure the conversion? Okay, uh, just to understand your question, are you talking about this from a B2B point of view or a B2C? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, unfortunately, I my email marketing experience lies completely in B2C, but I will try to answer the question. Um, for conversion rate, I wouldn't say that there is a there is a, there are benchmarks that are available on Google. If you you Google it now, you will know what what benchmark is for what industry. Um, if you want to tell the client um, as an average or or as a as a ballpark figure, then you could use that number because it's an industry average. You could use that number to give them that this is the average conversion rate. Um, but if you want to give the client a conversion um, rate number that is more personalized to them, then you'll have to audit their program to see what it has been previously, how it had been working previously, um, what have been the conversion rates historically, and what changes need to do, and how would you predict a conversion rate increase based on your predictions or based on your um, suggestion? Uh, that can only be defined based on the prediction, not on the you know specific base. Nothing. Okay. No. Because we we cannot anticipate this would be the exact defined conversion rate. Like you know if the consumer or the clients want, I no. need 10% conversion rate, you know? You could try, okay. because email marketing as such, I don't think can be nailed down to one single thing. So uh, your email, for, for example, today if you send it out to 1,000 users, you would get 50% open rate. But the next very day, you send out another, th another 2,000 users, you could get a lesser open rate for many different reasons. It could be your deliverability, it could be you've hit a ton of spam filters, or it could just be that the, that's not the right day for the user. It could not be the right time for the user. There's a ton of things that affect an email marketing performance based on what day and what content are you sending. 
Um, for, so for you to give a user or a kind of client a, a guaranteed conversion rate, I don't think is the right thing to do. Exactly. Even I cannot anticipate in yeah. my own agency too. Yeah. 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 I just want to add something to it. See, the email service providers like Google Workspace or Outlook, they have been very smart nowadays. They have installed the intrusion prevention system uh, between the sender and the receiver. It can easily predict if the email is coming from a mass engine or if it is sent in a personalized way. There are a lot of limits, a lot of regulations into it. Eventually, down the line, two years, you shouldn't be surprised if you see that bulk emailing is not going to work. It will not. Because it will not work. Because from Feb 1st, Gmail and Yahoo have included those uh, the DMARC specifications, right? Absolutely. Everybody who is a sender needs to be DMARC authenticated now. <laughs> yeah, I think they have also derived the daily limit. You know, first they need to grow. Uh, you know, their email marketing campaign. IP warming. That's called IP warming. Yeah. And you have to do it no matter what service you're using. Um, that's how you're, you're telling your user, that's how you're telling Google, Yahoo, AOL, whoever it is, that you are a legitimate sender and the users have to open an email. And the best way to do it is only maybe select very less number of accounts to reach out with buying intent. I think quality overs, you know, quantity. Quality, always. So within IP warming itself, uh, how you would start is you would start sending it out to the most loyal users who have been consistently opening your emails and the most recent openers so they can open your email again. Start with them and then go increase your uh, IP warming session to the larger audience. I would not send an IP warming email to a, an inactive user. Uh, that doesn't make sense. But then once you are properly warmed up and then your IP is all ready to send out, then you can always send it out to many users. Thank you so much. And that is all the time we have for questions. But everyone, I please invite you to take your phones. As you can see, our panelists, you know, the masterminds, their names are right over there. Please open your LinkedIn's and search up their names or take a photo of the screen right now. Search up their names, connect with them. So if you don't have a chance right now to ask something, you can have a chance later. And you'll answer, right? Yes? OK, perfect. All right, everyone, can we please put our hands together in a massive round of applause? <laughs> Mr. Harsha, Mr. Anan, Mr. Elias, Mr. Rakesh, and Mrs. Ramia. Would you like to take a video with the crowd?